Sounds True presents Music is Medicine, Session 12, Musical Form, with Kay Gardner. And now we come to the final element of music and healing, and that is form, the structure of music, how it moves, how it moves us in particular directions. In 1968, I had an idea for a composition, which was pretty odd because at the time I did not consider myself a composer. I was just a flutist. But I thought it would be interesting to start a piece and build up to a central point, like an arc, and then come back down again to the end of the piece in exactly the way I had gone up to that arc. It was just an intellectual exercise. But later in the early 70s, when I was researching women's music, where women's music came from, and trying to determine whether or not there was a female aesthetic, I started looking into the form that pieces of music took. Like Judy Chicago was exploring female aesthetic in art, I wanted to know whether there was a female aesthetic in music. But there's a difference between music and art. Art exists in space. Music exists in time. I met a musician named Laurel Wise, and Laurel was one of those musicians who'd never had any formal lessons, but could sit down, look at the sky, and literally play the clouds. She was quite amazing, and she told me that she thought, yes, there was a female aesthetic in music. I was living in New York City at the time, and Laurel was visiting and she and I heard about a people's festival that was being held down in Greenwich Village. So Laurel and I snuck into the concert, hoping that we would hear truly what we thought might be women's music. Well, it was the early 70s, and there were the usual folk singers who were changing the words of the songs to reflect feminist sensibilities. There was also a group of Balkan singers from Philadelphia called the Penny Whistlers, This was pretty close to women's music, we thought, but it wasn't quite what we were listening for. And then the lights dimmed. The lights went down in the room, and a marimba was rolled onto the stage. On one end of the marimba was a bell. On the other end was a suspended cymbal. On either end was a lit candle. And the musician, Jerry Ann Hilderly, came out and began to play the marimba in rolling chords. And as she played the marimba, she began to sing. I live in a house of many colors, colors of the sun. And the music built, and it built, as she repeated the chant over and over again. And then she started chanting a new set of words, words from an Arapaho Indian chant. Into thine arms, Mother Moon, we put our faith again. We enter thy darkness so lightly. We enter thy darkness with love. And then she went into a wailing that was, well, it was kind of embarrassing because it was the kind of wail that you would only hear in a birthing room or in a bedroom where folks were making love. So it was kind of embarrassing, but it was uniquely female and Laurel and I looked at each other, and we both knew this was women's music. And after that long orgasmic wail ended, she went back to the Arapaho chant, and then back down to the chant that she had started with, I live in a house of many colors, colors of the sun, which I realize today is a song about the chakras. But this was a unique form I had never heard it before. I was amazed. It was totally different from what I had experienced in any kind of music before. Two weeks later, I traveled with the band I was playing with at the time. The band was Lavender Jane Loves Women. And we traveled to Boston, and a singer opened for us. And the singer's name was Lou Crimmins, and she was writing a piece in process called Woman She, Woman She, Woman She, I Am a Woman. Like Jerry Ann, she built and built and built on the chant 
until in the middle of the piece, she too let out a huge wailing. But unlike the orgiastic wailing of Jerry Ann, Lou Crimmins let out the cry of an Amazon warrior. And then she resumed the chant, woman, she, woman, she, woman, she, I am a woman. So these forms were similar. Within two weeks, two musicians who, incidentally, did not have a whole lot of musical training, had created pieces of music in the same form. I thought, I've come upon a musical form that is unique to women, and I was fascinated by it. I went to my music books and looking up in the form books, what is this kind of form? And none of them had it. It was close to a rondo, which is a type of form that builds to a center section. But the center section isn't as transformational. It wasn't a short, wailing sound, usually in music, so that I found that the books did not describe this exactly. So I thought I had found the female form in music. And I began to write pieces of music in that form, where the climax, instead of being at the end, was in the middle somewhere. And I defined it as circular form. Most of us don't analyze music as to what the form is. When we hear a folk song, we hear a verse, and then a chorus, and then a verse, and then a chorus. If you were to analyze it, that would be A, B, A, B, A, B. And that is the usual form of a folk song. In classical music, many times the climax tends to happen toward the end. I was really interested in what kinds of music happen with the climax at the middle so that you can go back and hear it over and over and over again. And then it builds, and then it comes down again. And it seemed to be like the cycles of the seasons, like the cycles of the full moon, like a woman's menstrual cycle. And I was working very closely with how the moon moved through its phases and how I was feeling at the time was very, very centered in women's music and women's experience. I knew that this music was transforming, and I wondered why. And I realized that music takes us with it. Whatever form it is in, we follow that and we go with it. So that if we have structure in a piece of music, it's kind of like the skeleton on which the music is built. It's a form, it's a structure we can relate to. And if the structure is organic, then we truly relate to it. If it is not so intellectual that we cannot relate to it, it will touch us much more deeply. If it duplicates an organic form. One of the people who started looking into music as healing was Helen Bonney who was involved with research at Johns Hopkins in the late 60s using psychedelic drugs. Now, when psychedelic drugs were banned and put on the black market, she and her cohorts were not allowed to use them anymore, so she started using music instead. And she found that music could access the deep feelings and the deep sensations that the psychedelics could and music could go even deeper into the psyche than the psychedelics could. And she and Stanislav Grof, whom some of you may recognize as a proponent of holotropic breath work, started using music in their work instead of the psychedelics. Grof uses music as a kind of rebirthing mechanism. In a session of holotropic breath work, one listens to very primal music and the primal music builds to a very etheric spiritual music and then comes down again to a place of regularity. So it, too, has a form and direction in which we listen to it. Helen Bonney, a colleague of Graf's, went in a slightly different direction and developed a technique called guided imagery through music, in which the therapist plays a piece of music, and there were certain pieces that were prescribed for certain patients or clients, and these pieces of music are played, and the listener is taken on a journey. And the listener describes the journey to the therapist as 
the listener is going through it, and at the very end of the process draws a mandala, a meditational art piece, describing the journey. She found that she was able to access, with the music, the feelings and emotions of the client in a much quicker way than just talk therapy. And this particular technique at first was on the lunatic fringe of music therapy. That was about 20 years ago. Now it is regularly used and is taught throughout the United States. So form, how the music moves, is extremely important in creating healing music. In 1976, someone sent me a beautiful card on which was the picture of a chambered nautilus. And I was fascinated by that shape because I was interested in those days, as I mentioned earlier, in form, how things were shaped, and how could I put the shape of a chambered nautilus into my music? How could I write the shape of a chambered nautilus? I was fascinated by the card. I didn't know why, but I had to know everything I could about it. I called the local library. I asked them to look up chambered nautiluses, because I didn't have a car at the time. And I asked them to look it up. How many chambers are there in it? How do they progress in size? I needed to know everything I could. And again, I had no idea why. So I let it go. 1981, I did a tape called Moods and Rituals. And I wanted to take the listener on a journey. And the form I decided to use was the shape of an ocean wave, where there would be a trough, the, the shape would go up to a crest, then cascade down again into the trough. And it could be repeated. And I created a piece called Soul Flight with a machine called an Echoplex. Well, these days we don't use the Echoplex. But in those days, they used it a lot. What happened was you played a little bit of music, and then it would echo back what you had played. In creating the piece of music, I listened to the Echoplex overnight and tried all the different settings, because there were two settings on the machine. One, how many echoes, and two, how far apart would the echoes occur. The engineer and I listened to all the different settings on the Echoplex to determine how they would make us feel. And then we determined that there would be a certain sequence that we would use. In those days, we didn't have a lot of money to go into studios, so we snuck into a studio where the engineer worked at night and started recording this piece. And as the piece built, we got to the setting 13-7, Seven was the distance between the echoes, and 13 was the number of echoes. And something magical happened. And this was at the height of the crest of the wave. All of a sudden, feedback started happening. Well, the interesting thing about feedback is it'll always be on the harmonic of the music that's just been played. So it is in harmony with what has just been played. And I looked through the window at the engineer, and I thought, gee, should I go on? There's some feedback happening here. And she looked at me, and we decided that the feedback sounded great. And I closed my eyes, and I continued to play, and all of a sudden I was transported. I started blowing into the flute and using all kinds of techniques I'd never used before, like I was playing in the clouds and out of body. And it was a remarkable experience because the studio is such an artificial situation that very rarely... Can you go out like that? And then the music cascaded, went back down to the trough, and ended. And we called the piece Soul Flight. I was telling a composer friend about this, and she said, Oh, well, it sounds like that piece was written in the divine proportion, the golden mean, you know, that sacred geometry. Well, I had a math block, so the minute I heard the word geometry... I just kind of shut off. But later I got intrigued by it. I went to a conference of women's music in 1983, and a woman named Patsy Escott, a composer, delivered a lecture at 8 o'clock in the morning on the great Christian mystic Hildegard of Bingen and her music. 
and in this lecture she analyzed one of the chants of Hildegard. And she showed that the chant itself had the exact shape of a Gothic cathedral. She was able to take the chant and translate it into a three-dimensional form, and the form was just the same as the Gothic cathedral. Well, I didn't understand much of what she was saying. It was too mathematical. So I didn't quite follow it, but I was fascinated by this. Later I realized, I've got to learn more about this. I've got to know about this. Composers write with this form. Artists use this form. Architects use this form. Many of the sacred buildings of the world are created in this form. I need to know about it. And so I wrote to Patsy Escott and asked her to help me through this block. If I could learn nothing but this, it would be enough. And so she taught me what it was. What is the golden mean? What is the golden section? Also called the divine proportion. Robert Lawler, who wrote a book called Sacred Geometry in 1982, wrote, Geometry deals with pure form, and philosophical geometry reenacts the unfolding of each form out of a preceding one. It is a way by which the essential creative mystery is made visible. And that is kind of like the chambered nautilus, because the little creature moves from chamber to chamber as it gets larger and larger and larger. So it is the spiral form or the circular form that I thought was female aesthetic that I was hearing in the music, where the climax happens somewhere toward the center and not at the end. And there's a mathematical formula that states this particular shape. The golden section is a form where the climax happens toward the middle. And it's found throughout nature, this particular form, in the chambered nautilus, in the pine cones, in the florets of a sunflower, in our DNA structure. It's found throughout nature. And here is how it works. Imagine a line, just a line. And let's say that the length of the line equals 1. If the line is cut into two segments at about two-thirds of the way, or 0.618, that is called the golden cut. And that divides the line in this way. The smallest segment of the line is to the largest segment of the line as the largest segment of the line is to the entire line. In other words, the small segment is called A, the large segment would be called B. So A is to B as B is to A plus B. And that very simply is the formula. The cut in the line that divides it into those two segments is at 0.618, which is somewhere between half and two-thirds of the line. So, when we're thinking of a chambered nautilus and we see the sizes of the chambers proceeding, each chamber is in relation to the one that precedes it in this same proportion. The small one is A, the larger one is B, then it, when it gets to the larger one, the same proportion happens. We would call that A moving to the B form and A moving to the B form. In other words, the spiraling out is in a precise measurement. And this same precise measurement happens in the size of pine cone florets and sunflower florets and many, many, many other things in nature. This is a unifying principle found throughout nature. Relationships, according to the golden section, are also found at the molecular level within us, <laughs> with the double helix spirals that contain each individual's genetic code, the DNA molecule. Also, according to the Brain-Mind Bulletin, new research is also finding that the golden section is a ratio found in the functioning of human brain responses. The architect Ann Ting wrote, 
as a matrix for the human brain, the divine proportion, and this is the same thing as the golden section, just other terms for it, the divine proportion forming principle includes the processes for probability and for order for the brain's evolutionary origins and sets no limit to the future evolution of the human brain and its creativity. Within such a matrix, the brain forms as it is being formed. It is forming in the same proportion as we find in nature. Visual artists translate the golden proportion into a form that is thought by many to be the most aesthetically pleasing shape that there is, and that is called the golden rectangle, in which the ratio between the longer and the shorter side is 0.618, or the Greek letter phi. Leonardo da Vinci taught anatomical proportion by placing drawings of the entire human body within a golden triangle, measuring the half point at the sexual organs and phi at the navel. In architecture, the Parthenon at Athens is built in the ratio of the height to the width. Other famous structures are the Egyptian Temple to Osiris, the Roman Triumphal Arch of Constantine, and the Athena Temple of Priene. All of these have golden rectangles determining their proportion. Even the deck of playing cards is in the golden proportion. So these examples of the divine proportion are easily discernible when they are viewed because they occur in space. But our concern is musical form, and it occurs in time. So how can we use this divine proportion in compositions, and how has it been used, and why do we use it? I think the answer to that is, and I'm going to quote from my book here, if music with healing intent is to be written with both aesthetics and function in mind, it is reasonable to use a form or musical direction that defines natural growth, expansion, beauty, proportion, and balance in nature. Wouldn't a piece of music in a form that relates to listeners at the biological level, from molecular structure to brain functioning, as well as the perceptual level, as in visual appreciation and aesthetics, wouldn't that be the most effective way to define the direction of listening, bringing the listener into balance with the basic and universal patterns of life itself? Music written using the divine proportion is bound to be of value in the field of healing music precisely because of its directional relationship to life cycles and to the forms of universal consciousness. In other words, when we are creating or choosing music, if we can know that it has been written in a structure that we can relate to through our own molecular structure, as well as many structures in nature and art, it will touch us more deeply and we will relate to it because it is the same structure that exists within ourselves. And this structure is the divine proportion as I said earlier, Patsy Escott did a whole analysis of a Hildegard chant, but she used another formula that's a lot easier to get than the A is to B as B is to A plus B. And this is a series of numbers called the Fibonacci series. You might want to write these numbers down as I say them. One, two, three, five, 8, 13, 21, 34, 55, 89, 144, 233, 377, ad infinitum. You don't have to go up that far. Now look at this series of numbers. Notice each number is the sum of the two numbers preceding it. Does that make sense? 1 plus 1 equals 2, 2 plus 3 equals 5, 3 plus 5 equals 8, and so on. Well, that's interesting in itself, but if we divide any individual number in the series by the number preceding it, we will get ratios that fall very close to 5. In other words, if we divide 21 by 13, we get 1.615. As we continue the progression, the ratio becomes more exact as we climb higher in the series. But the unique thing about the series is 
we get the golden ratio when we divide one number by the one that precedes it. So it's a lot easier to use this formula in music. In other words, if I wrote a piece that's 21 minutes long, the climax would occur at 13. If I wrote a piece of music that was 34 minutes long, the climax would happen at 21. I used it in Soul Flight because the piece of music was 21 minutes long, and the climax happened at about 13. And that's why my friend, when hearing it, said, oh, that piece is written according to the divine proportion. I had no idea this was happening because I just felt it should. And perhaps because this is a very organic proportion, then intuitives who are in touch with things would write in that form. But you can use the formula as well. And composers as far back as Hildegard have used it and as close to us as Chopin. I'd like to play you one example of music written in the divine proportion. This is a prelude, prelude number one by Frederick Chopin. There are 34 measures in the piece. That is a Fibonacci number. At the eighth measure is the lowest sound in the piece. At the 13th measure, the piece changes direction. At 21 is the highest note in the piece, and then the piece ends at 34. So let me play the piece. It's very quick. It runs by very quickly. Note that the Fibonacci numbers are where the interesting things start happening in the piece. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen, eighteen, nineteen, twenty, twenty-one, twenty-two, twenty-three, twenty-four, twenty-five, twenty-six, twenty-seven, twenty-eight, twenty-nine, thirty, thirty-one, thirty-two, thirty-three, thirty-four. So again, as I did in Soul Flight, I used 21 minutes as the basis of the golden proportion, with 13 minutes being the height of the crest. With Chopin, it was by measure numbers, 34, using the Fibonacci series. Anton Webern, another 20th century composer, has used pieces that are 55 notes long, and the interesting things happen at the numbers of the Fibonacci series. I wrote a composition, Viriditas. It's a Latin word coined by Hildegard of Bingen, and it means greening power. And I used the Fibonacci series. This piece was to be recorded on a garden of ecstasy, so I had determined that the work would be 21 minutes long, like Soul Flight was. I wrote this piece for people who were going into transition, who were in life-threatening dis-ease. I especially wrote it for people with AIDS after having visited many outpatient groups and talking with them about what kind of music touched them. It was in three movements. The first movement honors the despair and the depression that one would feel when one is suffering from a life-threatening disease. The second movement was intended to take the listener out of body through the use of harmonics. And the third movement was intended to bring the listener back down into a place of resolve and acceptance. So the piece is 21 minutes long. The point of the deepest despair happens eight minutes into the piece and is uttered by the lowest instruments in the first movement.
and then the movement finishes at a very low point, and coming from that low point, the second movement starts to move up again, and at 13 minutes, it reaches its highest crest. At this point, at 13 minutes, we are leaving our body, we're out of physical sensation. The drumbeat, which has been continuous throughout the heartbeat, has stopped. And then the harp brings us back down again to earth, and the drumbeat begins, and we are grounded again. And the whole piece ends with a third movement at 21 minutes. I find that consciously writing and composing using the divine proportion is pretty fascinating, but form, remember, in healing music, it determines the direction of the listening, the structure on which all the other musical elements are placed. And because the divine proportion is biologically relevant to us, duplicating our molecular structure and the functioning of our brains, I believe that we resonate with this form. Therefore, used in healing music, it brings us in balance with life's patterns, and to be balanced, is to be healed and whole. And here we come to the end of the session. Let's review all the different elements of music healing, beginning first with intent. Stating one's intention, using perhaps the non-denominational prayer, may the work that I do be used for the highest good. And then the musical elements themselves, the drone, its function is to touch us in specific places. Long, uninterrupted drone sounds. Repetition, the function of which is to get us relaxed through familiarity and comfort, moving to receptivity. Harmonics, the bridge between the physical and the spiritual. The element that touches our auric layers. Rhythm, duplicating the healthy pulse, whether it's the heartbeat, the breath cycle, or the brain waves. Harmony, the emotional function in music. Harmony touches our moods. Melody, melody's function is to take us out of physical sensation and help relieve us of pain. Instrumental color, again, like the drone, each instrument, because of its harmonic makeup, will touch a specific part of the body. And finally, musical form, the direction in which we are taken by the music. Ending the circle again with intent, these are the elements that make music healing. I foresee a time when we will be using music more and more for healing. Already we are finding that there are musical practitioners playing at hospital bedsides and hospice bedsides. But I can see that it will be even more when we learn how to interface our synthesizers with medical machines, 
so that we can duplicate the heartbeat right there on the spot of people who are needing it. I also foresee that we get more in touch with wailing walls. If we looked at the Vietnam Memorial in Washington, D.C., here is a great American wailing wall. If any of you have visited it, you know that the energy there is that of a wailing wall. We are so repressed, we hold so much inside, it's so important to let it out as it is happening. I think every community should have a wailing wall. Get together with your friends. Give each one of them an element. Form a circle and have them bring their instruments. This is kind of a fun thing to do, and yet it's very powerful. If a person has some physical distress or emotional distress, ask them to lie down in the middle of the circle. Take that person's pulse. Get the people who are playing the drums to beat with that person's pulse. Play a few different musical modes. See which one or ones that person relates to. And then start playing melody with that repetitive drumming, the drumming that is duplicating the heartbeat. Before you start all this, you might want to shake a rattle in that person's ear to get them out of their heads and into the experience that's about to happen. Then the heartbeat is going. Then the bass instruments can find a repetitive theme. Then the melody instruments can go with the mode or scale that the person seems to relate to the most. And there you are creating a healing circle right with your friends. Others can be chanting harmonics and sending energy to that person. And slowly, slowly the drumming can be moving out of the rate, if it's unhealthy, the rate of the heartbeat, into a healthy, regular beat. And then just let yourself go. Be in touch with that person. Meld with that person just for a time so that you can create music especially for the person who is in the center. We have done this many times. We find it extremely healing in the groups that I work with. You do not have to be able to play an instrument wonderfully. Remember, your own voice is the most powerful and most healing instrument of all. So even in a singing circle, you're going to find that it's extremely powerful and a wonderful place to do healing. But with instruments, you can add a new dimension to it. Even if you don't play an instrument, you can play a drum. You can keep a beat. You can be the rattle player. You can chant harmonics. There's a place for everyone in the healing circle, whether you're lying in the center of it or whether you are making the music and working with the person or persons in the center of the circle. I'd like to leave you with a healing chant that I learned from Vicki Noble. You might want to sing along with it and share it with your friends. Oh, purify and heal us. Oh, heal us and free us. Oh, purify and heal us. Oh, heal us and free us. Oh, purify and heal us. Oh, heal us and free us. Oh, purify and heal us. Oh, heal us and free us. Oh, purify and heal us. Oh, this concludes Music as Medicine with Kay Gardner. For information on workshops and performances by Kay Gardner, contact her at P.O. Box 33. Stonington, Maine, 04681, or phone 207-367-5552. To order additional copies of this program, or to receive a complete catalog of transformational audio and videotapes, please contact Sounds True. 
P.O. Box 8010, Boulder, Colorado, 80306-8010, or call 1-800-333-9185. Thank you for listening.